Next, on the OHIO Podcast, we preview Ohio State's first road game of the season as they travel to East Lansing to take on Sparty. Plus, we talk about which program a young coach would rather take over, Nebraska or Wisconsin. And that all starts right now. It's so easy to be average. You know it as well as I know it. It takes a little something to be special, Don. It takes a little something special to be a great player. We don't have enough great players. To hell with that! We don't want to coach average. I don't want to be around you. Why be around average? Be proud of our young people in the classroom, in the community, and most especially in 310 days in Ann Arbor, Michigan, on the football field. Three things. Number one, the team that hits the hardest and the longest, the team that starts the fastest, and the team is too damn smart to make mistakes. If you take it to them, if you don't make mistakes, and you keep taking it to them, hell, there's no question who will win. It's time for the best Buckeye podcast by fans for the fans where they hate that team up north as much as you do. It's time for the OHIO podcast. OHIO! Welcome back to the OHIO podcast, everybody. I'm your host, Buckeye Bob, recording live from beautiful North Central Ohio, where I am joined by both my co-hosts, Chris Wilds from Marion, Ohio, and Aaron Brown from the deep south i guess texas they're part of the south yeah i suppose <laughs> i think they're west eric west out west look texas is the size of europe right they can be whatever they want to be i suppose oh, geez there we go why don't we just get a little bit more braggadocious while we're at it why don't you throw in there that it was 80 degrees today it, it, 84 well we had 70 <laughs> So we'll take it. I don't know how many more of these we're going to have. But anywho, folks, we've got some great info, uh, great news for you. Chris and I are going to be down in Marietta, Ohio, this Saturday for the Buckeyes, Brats, and Brews Big Bash at the Marietta Elks Lodge, number 477. It is located at 414 Colgate Drive, Marietta, Ohio, 45750. You can meet former Buckeyes Mike Wargo and Jamal Luke, get an autograph, meet Chris and I. Chris is somewhat of a Facebook celebrity, so I hear. So uh, I'm sure, Chris, have you been working on your autograph any? Uh, You know, nobody wants my autograph, Eric. Oh, come on. That's not true. That's I'll take it. I'll take that autograph. That, that's not that's not true. The, the bill collectors once a month want my <laughs> The bill collectors, yeah, the uh, eighty seven thousand new IRS agents, right? They're going to be oh, that's right. autographs too, I'm sure. But uh, the Buckeyes uh, go on the road for the first time this season, and we're going to be down in Marietta to watch that game with some of Southeast Ohio's finest Buckeye fans that are out there. Looking forward to meeting some new people, gaining some new listeners, and meeting some of our listeners that are down in Southeast Ohio. And of course, when Mike Wargo is there, the party is there. Isn't that true, Chris? Well, without a doubt. I mean, th- this guy, no, you know, I thought we were pretty good hype guys, Eric, but I, I don't know. I think we kind of pale in comparison to Mike. He, <laughs> he's having a good time. Yes. You know, uh, um, Notre Dame's got their Rudy. Ohio State has got our war go. And that's just facts. That's just the way it is. More of Buckeye Nation needs to meet Mike Wargo. Uh, the guy's fantastic. Looking forward to that show. And uh, please come on out. It starts at 2 o'clock. The doors open at 2 o'clock. The party goes till 4 o'clock when the game kicks off there in East Lansing. Let's talk a little bit about that game, guys, shall we? I'm seriously looking forward to this because not only is it the first time we get to see our Buckeyes in the road whites, but I think this is the first time that Ohio State is going to not get challenged, but I think get challenged in a different way is kind of how I'm looking at this because 
I don't know about you, Aaron, but when I look at Michigan State and I and Chris, I know you're going to dive into the statistics here in a little bit. But what I see is a football team that's reeling. And sometimes that can be a very dangerous thing. You know, their backs in the corner. Are they going to come out swinging that type of, uh, you know, uh, look at things? But let's dive into the numbers a little bit, shall we? Ohio State leads the all time series with Sparty. 35 to 15. So in 50 games, we are at 70% winning percentage. Ohio State has won the last six in a row. Of course, the last time we lost to Sparty was on that fateful cold, uh, I think it was no, a November night in 2015 uh, when we lost to Sparty 17 to 14, and we just couldn't call it a Zeke run in the second half for some reason. Last meeting last year when Ohio State's way 56 to 7, which was the largest margin of victory in this series, believe it or not. The last time we went to East Lansing was two years ago in 2020, and uh, that was pretty much a blowout as well, 52 to 12. Our largest margin of defeat that came from the hands of Sparty was in 1965. That was 32 to 7. Ooh, bad year that year. Ohio State's longest win streak over Michigan State is eight. We're trying to make it number seven uh, this Saturday. Of course, that eight-game winning streak came during uh, the end of Woody Hayes' tenure into Earl Bruce's tenure from 1975 to 1984. And our longest losing streak to Sparty was from 1912 to 1953 when we lost three straight times uh, in that span of course, uh, I don't think Michigan State joined the Big Ten until I believe it was in the 60s, if I'm not mistaken, Chris. I'd have to look that up. But I think they didn't join the Big Ten until either 60s or 70s. Ryan Day's record against Michigan State is currently 3-0, and and Mel Tucker's record against the Buckeyes is 0-2. and Looking back at the last 10, we are 8-2 and two in those last 10, which seems kind of interesting when we take into account that for a while there, it seemed like we were going back and forth with Sparty in the late uh, 2000s into the early 2010s. But like I said, since that loss in 2015 in the Horseshoe, we have won six in a row. And ro- since Ryan Day has taken the helm, they have just been blowouts. He is not uh, not one uh, not uh, won by any less than believe it or not twenty four points or three scores. Though so should be interesting if that in it is indeed what we see again coming this Saturday. Chris, how about we check out the statistics from Ohio State and Sparty heading into Saturday? Well, I'll tell you guys, Michigan State enters Saturday's game with a two and three record. And this is far from the dynamic Spartans we saw a majority of last season. The offense ranks 82nd nationally overall. They are getting about 371 yards per game, just shy of that. They are 72nd in scoring offense at 27 points a game. They are abysmal in red zone conversions, only converting about 76.47 of their opportunities into points, which ranks 90. First in the nation. Defensively, they've been just as woeful. Now, while the Spartans do rank 33rd in the country in scoring a deep in scoring defense, only surrendering about 22.6 points per game, offenses pretty much have their way with this Spartan defense, averaging about 411.8 yards per game. The Spartan defense also struggles to get off the field. And I know this is this is a number that I know Aaron's gonna like. They are a hundred and third in the nation in third down conversions allowed at 44.16, 79th in fourth down conversions allowed at giving up 60%. Not good statistics when you're facing off and off, off against an offensive juggernaut like the Buckeyes. So let's dive a little bit deeper into their offense. Now, this is an offense which passes the ball for 253 yards a game, 74th in the country. They also run the ball for 127.4 yards per game. That currently ranks 98th in the country. The offense is led by junior quarterback Peyton Thorne. Thorne had a breakout campaign in 2021, completing over 60% of his passes for 3,240 yards, 27 touchdowns against only 10 interceptions, and leading Michigan State to an 11-2 record and a Peach Bowl victory over 13th-ranked Pitt. 
This is a, year has been a completely different story, though. Thorne is completing more passes at 64.2%, but he only has got just over 1,100 yards of passing this season and has only eight touchdowns, and he's got six interceptions already. Now, sophomore Keon Coleman leads the Michigan State receivers with 25 catches for 308 yards and three touchdowns through the first five games. Three other receivers, including Jaden Reed, Trey Mosley, and tight end Daniel Barker, all have double-digit catches, but they only have between 100 and 200 yards receiving each. This is really an anemic passing offense, guys. The Spartans are also struggling to move the ball on the ground. You know, gone is Kenneth Walker, who last season compiled a Heisman-worthy campaign. And the Spartans uh, have turned to Wisconsin transfer Jalen Berger. Berger has 59 carries for 301 yards on the season, four touchdowns. Behind Berger is Jarek Broussard, who's a senior tailback. He's got 38 carries for 177 and two touchdowns. But guys, no other Michigan runner has more than 94 yards. I'm sorry, Michigan State runner has more than 94 yards on the season. This is an offense struggling to do much of anything at this point. And it's been against some pretty mediocre competition so far this season. Defensively, this is a defense that they do get to the quarterback. They have 13 sacks on the season as well as nine forced fumbles. A majority of that productivity is courtesy of linebacker Jacoby Windman. Now, he comes in with 23 tackles, but he's fourth in the nation in sacks with five and a half and first in the nation in forced fumbles with five. What the Spartans do not seem to do well, and we go back to last year, it was the same way. They do not defend the pass well. They do not have any interceptions on the season, which could make for a long day against this Buckeye offense. Now let's talk about the Buckeye offense a little bit. Ohio State comes in ranked third overall in total offense at 529.6 yards a game. They are the nation's number one scoring offense again, which we held that distinction last year. They are at 48.8 points a game. The Buckeyes average 303.4 yards passing per game, which is 18th in the nation and down a bit from last year. But what we do have going for us is we are up a bit with 226.2 yards rushing per game, which is 11th in the country. They are ranked number one nationally in points per play, yards per play, fourth down conversion. And guys, they are also first in red zone scoring. We rank third nationally in third down conversion. So why it may not always be always oh why it may not always be pretty, they are an effective unit. Defensively, we come in and we've talked about what would happen if we had a top ten defense. Well, guys, we are number nine in the nation in overall defense at this point, allowing 263.8 yards per game. We are number 10 now in scoring defense, surrendering only 14.8 points per game. They are are currently number 11 in yards allowed per play at only 4.4, 11th in third down conversions allowed at 27.14, and 15th in fourth down conversions, giving up only 28.57%. Statistically, this is a great team. Of course, the offense, led by C.J. Straub, Stroud's coming in, completing 68.7% of his passes, 1,376 yards. He has 18 touchdowns on the season, guys. That's third in the country. Only has two interceptions, and he has the second-best QBR in the nation, 93.7. Stroud has a plethora of receiving options to throw to. We've got a Mecca Egbuka who leads the team currently in receptions with 30 and receiving yards with 512. And is second on the team with five receiving touchdowns. Marvin Harrison comes in, 24 catches, 405 yards, and he is leading the team with six touchdowns. Cade Stover comes in, 13 catches, 200 yards, two touchdowns. And Julian Fleming, finally healthy, has 11 catches, 141 yards, four touchdowns. Those two guys have also been steady contributors. By the way, rumor has it we may be getting back the best receiver in college football within the next game or two in Jackson Smith and Jigba. They also have a two-headed, it's not a monster, guys. This is a two-headed beast in the backfield. In Mayan Williams and Travion Henderson. Williams comes in leading the team right now, 64 carries, 
497 yards, eight touchdowns after that huge week he had last week. He's averaging 7.8 yards per carry. Then there's Henderson who comes in to this game after a week of rest. All he's done this season is 50 carries, 318 yards, and three touchdowns. He's averaging 6.4 yards per carry. Guys, this may be the most balanced and complete offense that we have seen from the Buckeyes in some time. They can beat you either in the air or on the ground. One is just as dangerous as the other at this point. And you know what? Speaking of the best we've seen in a long time, how about the defense? I mean, it just keeps getting better every week. The defense, which a few weeks ago hadn't really gotten to the quarterback very much at all, hadn't really gotten many turnovers, is starting to ramp it up. They now have 10 sacks, three interceptions, and two forced fumbles. Tommy Eichenberg has established himself, I think, as the leader of this defense at this point, leading the team in tackles with 43. He's tied for the team lead in sacks with two. Alongside Eichenberg, two other play- or three other players have two sacks each, that being Michael Hall Jr., Jack Sawyer, and Javante John-Baptiste. Steel Chambers comes in, the other half of that linebacking duo. He has 30 tackles. He also has a sack and is tied with Ronnie Hickman and Tanner McAllister for the team lead in interceptions with one. Javante John-Baptiste and a somewhat more active Zach Harrison are tied for the team lead with one forced fumble apiece. Guys, this is a team that I think we are going to have a big opportunity to pad offensive and defensive stats against. They are a pretty bad team. Aaron, why don't you tell us exactly how we're going to do that? Break it down for us. Yeah, so, man, I'm telling you, the the numbers that you just gave out for Sparty, it, it completely matches up with what I saw on film, man. Like, their coverage is just garbage <laughs> it is so bad uh i just i i couldn't help but think and I, I don't know if you guys really watched it or if you've seen them play this year on tv at all but um watching their defense just it, it kind of put me in the mind of what our defense used to look like like last year like just we couldn't stop a cold there was a few games where yeah we looked great like ironically against Michigan state last year. But like, other than that, man, we just looked like we were struggling and that's what they look like. They run a four, two, five. They do it exactly the same way we do. They'll have three down linemen, one stand up guy. Sometimes they'll have two stand up DNs, um, or one D end, one D tackle. Uh, they do some weird, weird looks is what they like to do. Um, they'll walk linebackers up, drop them into zone coverage, or they'll have one drop, One blitz. Uh, They do a good job disguising things, unfortunately, for them. They're just not effective at doing it. Um, Poor tackling. Like I said, their zone coverage is crap. Um, (laughs) They don't look physical. Their DBs play really far off. um, And they do run a 4-3 in short yardage. um, But again, just not very effective. Um, and for Ohio State's offense, that just invites the RPO. Um, I watched uh, Sparty several films. Of, like I, I checked out Western Michigan. I watched what Maryland did. Um, and they both did a lot of RPOs. They did a lot of uh, inside zone, outside zone running, comeback routes, uh, traditional mesh, uh, shallow crossing routes. Uh, and I'll tell you what really hurt Sparty too was screens. And it didn't matter if it was running back or wide receiver, but if it was any kind of like screen to the flats, uh, that really killed Sparty. And, and it's because their DBs play so far off. They have to come running up at least seven to 10 yards, uh, roughly before they're even close to making contact. So I don't know what is going on in the defensive room in general for Sparty, but man, they look bad. Oh my goodness. Uh, Moving to the offensive side though. um, It's kind of the same thing. They just, they just don't look good. I I just, I don't think that they have the talent, you know, Um, I think Michigan state might've made a mistake extending uh, their coach the way that they did uh, based off of one year, you know, uh, they run a lot of 11 personnel, 10 personnel, uh, uh, 12 even. They'll come under center quite a bit. 
Uh, they they kind of mix it up like that a little more than what we are used to seeing. Um, personnel though, eleven. That, you know they'll run wide receiver motion into a bunch. Uh, they're not afraid in the if they do reach the red zone though. I will I will give them this credit, okay? Because they're still a little ballsy. Uh, and this is where it could hurt us based on recent defensive back play. All right, when they hit the red zone. They are not afraid to throw it up in a one-on-one situation. And if you're Peyton Thorne or or anybody on the offensive staff that has to do with play calling, you've seen Denzel Burke recently. Uh, and if he's in the game and you get him one-on-one with no safety help, there's a good chance that your receiver could make a play on him because he's not turning his head, at least not in the first five games. Uh, so that that could end up biting us. If Sparty does happen to reach that part of the field, uh, they will run a lot of inside zone, outside zone, which, you know, again, is kind of standard data across the board these days with spread offenses Um, under center, though. They like to do a lot of play action. That's kind of their main thing. Um, Tight end shallow crosses. They'll do wide receiver jet sweeps. (coughs) Excuse me. Uh, Under 12 personnel. They like to do a lot of double tight end wings, so you'll have a, a, a tight end at the wing spot on both sides of the ball uh, with the running back lined up in pistol. And I, honestly, I didn't chart every single play. I never do. But, yeah, I think it's safe to say seven out of ten times when they're in that formation, they're going to run a stretch play. And that can look like two, one of two things, okay? When they hand the ball off, uh, the running back, whether it's Jalen Berger or, or another guy, Uh, They can stretch it out to the side of the field they're running to. Or another thing they like to do is they will create like this wall where it looks like a stretch to one side, but the running back will cut it against the grain and kind of go back. So for Ohio State's defense, it's going to be imperative that the safety covering the short side or the weak side stays home and doesn't over pursue because if he does – that side of the field is going to be wide open with no defenders, and I don't care who you are. We could be playing Arkansas State again. We're going to get burnt if that happens. Um, but they also like to run that formation and do a play action off of that stretch. So they'll make it. They'll run the stretch play a few times, and then they'll hit you with uh, like a shallow crossing route or like a levels passing concept out of play action. Um, And if you see 10 personnel and they run trips, a lot of times those are deeper routes for them. So the key for Ohio State's defense, pressure Peyton Thorne. Don't leave wide gaps, okay? So I think it was Western Michigan or Maryland. It was one of those two. Um, They would line up their defensive tackle, uh, both defensive tackles kind of wide, like outside the shoulder of the guards, and then the defensive ends would be outside the shoulders of the uh, tackles. And that created a huge running space. And Peyton Thorne can hurt you. He's not, don't get me wrong, he's not Justin Fields, okay, but but he'll gash you for 15, 20 yards. You know what I mean? And that's, you don't want that to happen. I don't care. You just, that's, that's a no-no. Uh, so the big thing is pressure him, maintain gap integrity, uh, make sure that when you tackle the running back on on running plays, because, you know, you got Jalen Berger, so he's coming from the school of Wisconsin running backs. They don't go down easy. Uh, make sure that these guys are wrapping up good tackling, as we've seen all year. They've done a nice job cleaning that up compared to last year. We have to keep doing that. Um, and then finally, the defensive backs, mainly the corners. They have got to be alert when in the red zone. I can't stress that enough. If their heads are not turning, if they're not looking at their keys, uh, when you're running downfield with the receiver, the biggest indicator is when you see his eyes look up. You see his eyes look up, you should probably look up too and get your hands up uh, and position your body correctly. So I think those are the keys right there. Pressure, wrapping up, gap integrity, defensive backs, be on alert. Well, <clears throat> now that you are a smarter fan due to Aaron, Chris, and uh, I guess about 5% of that me, we are ready to make our predictions. Aaron, since you went uh, last last week, I'm going to let you go first this week. Okay. Let's – I'll say Ohio State 
45, Michigan State, 13. 45 to 13. Chris, what is your score prediction? Aaron, you're giving these guys way too much credit. Way too much. I'm going 56 to 6. Woo! Yeah, all right. You guys ready for this? Let's have it. I'm thinking we're going to have a huge bounce back week offensively. 66 to 10. I can see it. I'm not about 10, but I can see the 66. Ryan, Ryan Day looked upset this week for some reason. I think the 49 to whatever the score was last week, 49 to uh, 10, was it? Yeah. yeah. 49 to 10 didn't sit well with him. I, I, and I think Mel Tucker is going to be on the receiving end of this Ryan Day beat. <laughs> dude, dude, can you imagine winning by 39 and you're just like, man, that's not good enough. That's that's like what the media. That's all the questions the media had was about that. Dude, Nick Saban doesn't even get that treatment. Like, no, what? no. Why? He's... Why? Why is Ryan Day getting treated like that? I don't, like 39 points over anybody is really good. Rutgers is not a bad football team. They that, kind that, of are. Well, no, I think Rutgers can make a bowl game. It's not hard to win five games six, unless you're Northwest. You well, shoot, they went for five last year. I know, but I know a team dropped out, but you, you know, but guys, this is Ohio State, eleven and two in a Rose Bowl victory is just not good enough. It's just not good enough. Yeah, that's which that's is right. fair, but good lord. 39 points and people are questioning you. He wanted 50, baby. He wanted a 50 point spread. Hey, give me give me a 56 point win this weekend. I'm feeling I hope it. it happens. I'm feeling it. All right, guys, make your predictions as well. Go to our Facebook page. We'll post uh, our uh, Are You Ready Buckeye Nation uh, with our predictions on it at, uh, I believe, 8 a.m. tomorrow mornings when that's posted. Just go to the comment section underneath that and make your prediction. If anybody hits it exactly correct, you'll win a free T-shirt from the OHIO podcast. All right, we're going to take a quick commercial break. When we come back, we need to talk about what happened over there in Wisconsin because after we got done recording Sunday night, um, a bombshell dropped. And right after. Right after. And um, we need to pick up the pieces and talk about that. So hang tight, everybody. The OHIO Podcast is brought to you by Mastermind. Mastermind specializes in 360-degree high-definition mobile video mapping, GIS integration, and traffic safety studies. Mastermind cares about traffic safety and keeping you safe on the roadway. Visit Mastermind at OnlineMastermind.com. Welcome back to the OHIO podcast, and now is the time we are going to talk about the poll question of the week. So, Eric and Chris, the question this week was, if you were an up-and-coming college football coach and you had your choice, which program would you rather take over? Chris, let's hear who you picked and why. Honestly, I, I would probably take Wisconsin. I really would. I think there's a little more talent in Wisconsin. I also think that recent history has been a little more favorable towards Wisconsin. And I think that would make recruiting somewhat easier in Wisconsin. Um, not only that, but let's face it. Wisconsin typically goes towards, and it hasn't mattered about the coach, a certain type of athlete. I think that makes recruiting a little bit easier as well. Um, So for me, I think Wisconsin's the way I would go. Okay. So you don't think maybe Nebraska's like tradition appeal. I know they haven't really had tradition in like a couple decades, but I mean, sometimes that still has an appeal. I mean, look at that team up North, you know, they haven't won a, a national title outright since world war two and haven't won a shared since 97, but they're still kind of relevant. They are, but you know what? They're they're a bigger brand than Nebraska. That's I don't fair. think that Nebraska – yes, Nebraska does have some tradition. And you know what? For the over 45, over 50 crowd, it may, you know, maybe, maybe there's a little bit of that nostalgia there. But for these young recruits, most of these guys weren't even alive when Tom Osborne was over there. But none of them fact. were alive when Tom Osborne <laughs> was over there. 
That is so uh, true. So a lot of the coaching candidates <laughs> weren't alive when Tom Osborne was over there. <laughs> yeah. So you know what? To me, I just think that Wisconsin's recent history and and the situation with the program overall, I think it's in better shape. Okay. Yeah, I can go with that. Eric, who did you go with and why? Let me before I answer, I'm gonna ask you, Aaron, who do you think I went with? I think you went with Wisconsin. You thought incorrect. Really? I went with Nebraska. I was one of nine one of nine percent of people. <laughs> Is it because the standards are already so low, Eric? <laughs> <laughs> in Nebraska, it's just going to be easier to please no, no, because okay, they don't so, expect much. So you laugh about that, but here's the thing. Okay, so number one for me, you like Nebraska? Nebraska is a blue blood, correct? In what? Football. No, they are a blue blood. I don't. According to who? According to national championships, they got no blood left, Eric. It's all been drained. They got the. Uh, how, Look, how many titles me, do they have? Here, okay. Are they uh, three? Two or three? You, two or three titles is a blue blood? Historical and, I mean, okay. Second tier blue blood. How about that? Is that fair enough? No. Like, because like blue, Miami and. Bro, blue blood is Ohio State. Uh, I hate to say it, but that team up north, Alabama. Schools like that that have a track record over a long period of time. Nebraska's won a lot of football games. I'll give them that. And they had a hell of a decade in the 90s. But, like, I don't know that I'd call them a blue blood. Second tier in general, I'll agree with. But I'm going to say borderline. But let's go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. But let's let's hear the rest of what you have to say. Uh, did anybody know? Does anybody know who has the record for consecutive sellouts in college football? That'd be I mean, that's, the, that's Nebraska. Nebraska. Okay, but what else is there to do? By the way, they have five national championships. Okay, all right, five. I'll give them that. The whole that's, sellout thing, though, bro. There ain't nothing to do in Nebraska but turn over dirt. Of course, they're gonna sell out their football games. <laughs> There's nowhere else to go. It's an 85,000 seat stadium. I know that has a part in that. You know, it's harder to sell out a stadium over 100,000. Um, yes, you're right, Aaron. There's nothing but corn there. I understand that. But let's look at where they're at. Who's closer to Texas? Between who? Nebraska and Wisconsin? Nebraska. Yeah, it's Nebraska. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. So if I if I'm a young coach, who I'm thinking where. Which program is, do I have a better opportunity of getting that second tier athlete from a, a from a really good state such as Texas, Georgia, California, Florida to build my program with and sell to them the opportunity to to uh, ha, you know sell them the opportunity to uh, play at a bigger prestigious program when you know you have a sellout every single week. I think it's Nebraska. I think you can I think you can flip Nebraska quicker than Wisconsin. And hear me out. I think Wisconsin hit their ceiling. Why? I don't think I don't think Wisconsin will ever get better than what you what you saw when they went to the Big Ten championship three times in like what five years. And you think Nebraska is going to be better than that? I think Nebraska has the potential. To be better than that. When Nebraska came from the Big 12 and joined the Big 10, were we not all thinking we were getting the Penn State of the, of the West? That's right. what we, yeah, that's what we so thought. Yeah, how ridiculous we were. Well, it's how ridiculous things fell for them. When they, when, when they left the Big 12, they lost their recruiting base because they no longer could sell – Hey, to the Texas kids, hey, you're going to go back and play in front of the, the home fans. So if you go back and look at recruiting for, for Nebraska before and after they came to the Big Ten, it, they suffered in recruiting big time, big time. Now, Nebraska fans have always thought of themselves as more of a Midwest state, which is why they thought the fit, the fit with the Big Ten was going to be good for them. But they didn't take into account the loss in Texas recruiting. Because Nebraska has the, their backbone has always been built on recruiting the state of Texas. It has, because let's face it, high school football in Nebraska 
ain't worth building a program around. Okay. You're going to get a, a couple decent offensive linemen. Yes. But you've got to go get the athlete from Texas. And they failed at that. And I just think it's easier to do that there than it is to in Wisconsin. Wisconsin, you're right, Chris. They have a particular athlete they're looking at, but that athlete's never going to get you uh, to the college football playoff. Well, I don't, I don't disagree with that, but I'll tell you what, I don't think that Nebraska is going to pick anybody up when you got schools like Ohio State who really does well in Texas. When you've got an emerging Texas that's joining the SEC. When you've got Texas A and M, when you've got you know Jimbo out there is throwing the money around, and, uh, and there know. it is. Come on. I also nope. think nope. Nebraska has a has a much more um, willing fan base to jump in behind you financially when it comes to NIL than Wisconsin does. Yeah, at, I mean at this Just point in time. So I'm I'm looking at this in in the sense of is it going to be harder? Absolutely. Wisconsin is tailor-made for someone to step in and be successful tomorrow. Am, am I wrong with that? No, I agree. Yeah. Nebraska's not. They've got, Whoever gets that job has got their work cut out for them. There's no doubt about that. And they're going to at least that. five years to turn that program around. At least, if not more. I agree, Chris. But I think the ceiling for Nebraska is higher. I really do. And so if I'm a y- young, up-and-coming coach – I'm willing to shoot my shot here because in all honesty, this is going to make a lot of Wisconsin fans pissed. If they hear this, I look at Wisconsin as a stepping stone job. Yeah. It's not a destination job. It's not. You have, well, no, like, but there's only three destination jobs in the big 10. I mean, there's only three. I agree actually with that. Yeah, I agree. But I think Nebraska might be that next one. Could be. It could be. Like, it, we all thought Nebraska was going to come and dominate the West. I mean, that's what we all thought was going to happen. It didn't happen. You're right, Chris. But I just don't think they've had the right man here. And here's the thing I've been hearing floating around social media about Wisconsin. I, I want to get your guys' take on this. Did Wisconsin just Bo Pelini themselves? I think they did. Oh, absolutely. If they don't get the right guy, if they don't get the right hire – that program could bottom out like like Nebraska did. Wait, I think, dude, they're going to give it over to Jim Leonard, and I'm I'm sorry, but I'm not impressed by him. Actually, I'm not sorry. I'm not impressed you, by you him. You think they're gonna, they're going to give it over to Leonard? You don't think they're going to make a big push for a uh, uh, Leopold down there at Kansas? I no, I I, I don't, honestly I don't know. I can't say that for sure. Okay, but I'm I have a a, a strong feeling that they're going to turn it over to Jim Leonard because he's been there for what seven years as a as a coach and he's been their D coordinator. They like him. He's alumni. He's he's the Jim Harbaugh of Wisconsin, except he doesn't have the pro experience. So I I don't know. I, I suppose if a successful, a proven coach were to say, hey. I'm interested in the job. They would probably at least interview the guy, you know. Um, But like Leopold at at Kansas, what has he really done outside of this year? It's Kansas. What's he supposed to do? He he turned around the Buffalo program and made them a winner. And before that, he was a what was a Division two national champion. He's basically yeah. Jim six he's, division three national titles. Division three, yeah. He's basically okay. Jim Tressel is who he is. Okay, but I, I meant at this level, like Buffalo. Okay, Mac school did well. Urban Meyer came from a Mac school. He was a Bowling yeah. Green. I understand. Yeah. He is currently at Utah. Remember when Urban Meyer went from Bowling Green to Utah? Yeah. That's yep. where we're at in this guy's career. And so when he left Utah, Urban went to Florida, okay, and and built a national championship team there. I don't know that this guy takes the Wisconsin job. He's a I don't think – But he's a Wisconsin man, though. That's the thing. He's from the state. Well, you if know – If I'm not mistaken, he was also a graduate assist, uh, assistant there under Barry Alvarez, wasn't he? Well, that that right there, if if that's true, let me look that up. Let me look if, that up. If that happens to be true, right there, he was a GA under Alvarez. There might yeah, be ninety-one some, to ninety-three. Okay, see, he might be. You might be onto something there, Chris, because that's. I think that right there is a strong pull. And Alvarez is the AD still, is he not? Or did he stop? 
I think he stepped down. I, I okay. don't know. I know he was stepping down. I don't know if he stepped down completely. I know he still maintains an office on campus, but yeah. Okay. Well, that's still that's that's a good strong personal He's got relationship. Influence. So I mean, I think if Leopold wants the job, it probably is his. But does Jim Leonard leave? You know. Well, yeah, he leaves if Leopold gets it. I believe. You don't think he'll stay as a DC? No. No. I don't think else. so. I'm with you. I don't think he stays either. But I, I just wanted your thoughts on that. So, I mean, we kind of jumped the gun here. Let's go back to the to the poll question. Aaron, what what about you? I said Wisconsin. I voted Wisconsin. If I was an up and coming coach, because they're ready to to they're like you said, they're they're built to win. Now, here's here's where I, I kind of disagree, though. OK, because they have a specific system that they have had since Barry Alvarez, and we all know what it is. Run the ball, run the ball, and oh, yeah, run the ball. Hit the tight end occasionally, but mainly run the ball. How many how many running backs they put in the NFL? A lot. You got Melvin Gordon in there right now. Uh, you got Ron Dane, one of Heisman. Uh, who just retired from the Patriots? Oh, what the heck is his name? James White. Um, you know, you could name these guys. Jonathan Taylor's tearing it up for the Colts right now. Like they have all kinds of running back uh, lineage. Um, but we thought the same thing with Nebraska coming, you know, triple option. That's 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 what Nebraska was. Wishbone and triple option forever. Eric Crouch, Tommy Frazier, uh, <sighs> Scott Frost. You know what I mean? The names you could name them forever, but it took. A few guys to change that, you know, uh, Bo Pelini kind of changed that around. I think Wisconsin could be successful if they change some things around. I don't think that that's going to happen overnight, but I do think right now Wisconsin is more marketable than Nebraska is because right now Nebraska is a dumpster fire. Nobody wants to go in there and – you know what I mean? Like for tradition purposes, I suppose, uh, you know, you might. But if it's me, I'm an up and coming coach. I'm going to Wisconsin right now. I'm trying to win, make a name for myself, maybe change the culture up a bit. But I do agree. Wisconsin is a stepping stone. I think that, Eric, you're right. I think Nebraska is way more of a uh, a destination type job, but not right this minute. Not right now. Cool. All right, so Wisconsin coaching candidates, uh, I'm going to throw out some names, and obviously he- here's what I think first off. I think I think Jim Leonard is getting the opportunity to win this job. They're giving him an on-job interview, kind of similar to what they did Ryan Day when Urban Meyer was suspended for three games. I think they're saying, Jim, we under- you know, you're a hot commodity. Everybody's talking about you. We get it. Here's your opportunity to take a team that's two and three, see what you can do with it on the job. And if we like what we see, we're going to hire you. However, the AD uh, also mentioned that uh, he is going to do a national search at the end of the year regardless. So there's that to go along with this. But that could also just be AD talk. You know what I mean? Just saving face. So. Jim Leonard, obviously we all agree, yes, he's got the opportunity to win the job. I mean, that's that just goes without saying. So, yes or no, do you think he's a viable candidate? Lance Lapold from Kansas, uh, obviously, yes. You both agree? Yes. Yeah. Okay. The next, the next name on the list, it's on everybody's list, Matt Campbell from Iowa State. Aaron, yes or no? He's a viable candidate for pretty much any job, in my opinion. Chris? But I don't know that he goes to Wisconsin. Yeah, I agree. He's viable, but I don't know that he's the right fit for Wisconsin. I'm going to say no. I don't even think he's I don't even think he's the candidate. I don't even think they interview him because I don't think Matt Campbell gets past Nebraska, possibly. Well, that's I, I don't think that he has interest in Wisconsin. That's that's my thoughts. He's viable. He could take it if he wanted it, but I don't think that he will because I don't think he's interested. How about Dave Aranda from Baylor? He's getting a lot of pub lately. Yes no. or no? No, Chris? 
I, I think he's viable. This is my only concern with that. I don't think his style of offense plays in Wisconsin. Exactly. But is it? Hmm. Okay. But, and I'm is talking, it, when I say that, I don't just mean plays with the fans. I mean, I think it is difficult to play that type of offense in that type of weather. But I, that might be what part of the problem with Wisconsin is. They they know they have become so predictable offensively that they can't run with the big dogs. And that's why he kind of got fired, I guess. Is they they you have to be in big time college football, you have to expand. Now, wait a minute. Minnesota's just as cold as Wisconsin, is it not? It is. They can throw the football. Well, they didn't do a very good job last week against Purdue, but they have in the past. Well, do you think Minnesota may be going through a phase like Wisconsin did, where they just they have a little bit better talent than what the rest of the teams in the West did? Because Minnesota's not typically as good as they have been the last few years. Yeah, let's look at the defenses in the West outside of Iowa. Okay. Back, back. I don't know that I wouldn't use the word talent right now. I would use the word experience. They're the most senior laden team in the Big Ten. That's what Minnesota's got for them. I mean, Purdue proved to them that the talent. <laughs> you know, as soon as soon as uh, Ibrahim was out of the game, Minnesota had no answer offensively. Can I tell you one quick, like quick, crazy stat? Sure. Even with Nebraska's record, they're tied for first right now in the West. Yeah. They're still in this thing. So is Northwestern. Exactly. Yeah. Chris reminded us, hey, Northwestern. It is an even three. year. <laughs> it is the even year. Weirder things have happened. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Speaking of Baylor, how about Matt Rule for the Carolina Panthers? He's obviously going to get fired. He's going to come back to college football. And his name is popping up for just about every major college football position already. Yes or no, Chris? I like that bit. I like that fit a lot. Uh, you know, he's he's very defensive minded, but he's also he's not afraid to run the ball. He likes to run the ball. Uh, I think he would do very well, and in, in especially coming in right away with the type of players that Wisconsin currently has on campus. I mean, the dude went twenty and seven at Temple for goodness sakes. Yeah, and then he turned around the Baylor program after Art Bryles, you know, got fired for. Uh, hiring hookers for recruits. So, I mean, What's wrong with that. I mean, yeah, it's terrible, man. Is there anything in the NIL about that? Mm, not, not technically. It's the <laughs> wild west, man. They can do what they want. All right. Aaron, what do you think? Matt rule, dude, you think he could, could do it? I could see it fitting. Yeah. I, I'm on the same page as Chris and I'll, I'll, I'll even go a little bit further. The, the current trend right now is these college coaches going to the NFL and then coming back yeah. And they end up being more successful than they were before. And I think, honestly, not that Nick Saban was the first to ever do it, but he is probably the most clearest uh, vision of success doing so. All right. Last crazy name. <laughs> you know, I'm going to do it. Just don't do it, Eric. Get your no button ready. Just Urban even, Meyer. Why? No. No, time. because yeah. everybody brings it up every time. It's not happening. Urban Meyer. OK, now wait a second. Let me throw this out there. If Urban Meyer was going to coach at one of these two programs, which one do you think he would pick, Nebraska or Wisconsin? Probably Nebraska. Nebraska. Uh, yeah, I know. Isn't that crazy? After you they- both said Wisconsin, uh, Urban would probably take Nebraska. Why? Because they have the caliber, no, not caliber, but the style of athletes yes. that he would run his offense with. Yeah. Wisconsin doesn't. And I think they would also give him the money backing. I think so as well. I think that's that's a big thing, but I'll tell you why he would never mind. Good God, I hope not, because like you said, Ooh. the trend is for him to come back and do better than they did before. We can't have that in the Big Ten. Well, you can't kick kickers at, at the college level. That's true. Not not for free. Like they have to make money off of it. Oh Lord, I knew you were gonna get only fans. What? Well, right. this is the thing though. I don't know if there's no, enough you know clubs in either town to keep Urban happy. So, see, that's what I was holding my 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 tongue about 
earlier. I wasn't going to go there, but Chris, you did it. There's no way Shelly Meyer would agree to go to Lincoln, Nebraska. No way. With the Who money they you? have, why would she? <laughs> Chris, All what right. were you going to say? I said, who said he's even inviting her? That's fair. Ooh. Holy Ooh. crap. Ouch. All right. Let's move on before we get in more trouble. Uh, the big game predictions for this week. Here we go. This ought to be a lot of fun. Now, I did not write down what Vegas says about these games. I didn't even look them up because I know you don't like that, Aaron. And plus, uh, I just want us to just get true reactions based off of, like, who's playing and where they're playing at. So here we go. Uh, we've got uh, number 17 TCU at number 19 Kansas. Speaking of Kansas, uh, I'll go first. I'm going to go Kansas. Chris. Well, I'll tell you what, TCU looked awful good last week. But I, I think since it's at Kansas, I'm going to go with Kansas. Aaron, I'm I'm going TCU. Anybody can do that to Oklahoma on a Brent Venables defense, and I understand they're not all, like, his guys, but it's his scheming. And I, 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 Kansas is good. Don't get me wrong. They're good this year, but I think that uh, TCU is going to pull it out. All right. Number eight, Tennessee travels to number 25, LSU. Aaron, you went last. You get to go first. I'm going Tennessee. I am as well. I'm going to take the the Vols here on the road. Uh, Chris, what do you think? Well, Kelly had a nice week back in the top 25, but he's leaving again. I'm going Tennessee as well. All right. Number 11, Utah at number 18, UCLA. Another one of those surprising undefeated teams currently. Uh, Chris, your turn to go first. Yeah, you know what? I, I love Utah. I love the grittiness of Utah. But I'm going to take UCLA because I'll tell you what, I think we saw when they played Florida, they were exposed a little bit. I'm taking UCLA. All right. I think Utah is the better team here. I think UCLA is a little bit fool's gold. So I'm going to take the Utes, Aaron. Yeah, you know, I, I have the same feeling. I think Utah is just a little bit grittier, a little tougher, and a little more experienced. I know – UCLA's got some guys with experience, but I think overall, I think I got to go Utah. All right. And the next one, you know, I couldn't pass this up. The Mormons uh, ranked number 16th. The Catholics not ranked at all. And they're getting together in Sin City and Las Vegas, baby. And BYU's wearing black, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. BYU against Notre Dame in Vegas. Uh, give me the Catholics in this one. I think they found something against North Carolina two weeks ago. Uh, and quite frankly, we need Notre Dame to be good after uh, the close game we had in week one. So give me Notre Dame. Chris? Yeah, I wrote them last week against Carolina. I'm going to take them again this week, Eric. Yeah, you won that one hands down. I I thought North Carolina gave them a better game than that a couple weeks ago. So, Yeah. Uh, Aaron, you're going to go clean sweep with the Catholics or are you going to join the Mormons here? I really wish that it was Arizona state. Cause, uh, you know, the whole devils and Mormons thing from <laughs> the, last year, the Satanists. Yeah, that was fun. But, uh, yeah, I think we're going to make it a clean sweep. We'll go with the Irish. All right. Catholics. It is. All right. This game had so much potential at the beginning of the year. Now just doesn't look nearly as fun as what it could have been. The Jimbo Fishers of Texas A&M will go on the road to take on number one ranked Alabama. But that Alabama team definitely has some chinks in the armor. Can the Aggies muster up enough to make that big upset on the road? Or is this going to be a revenge factor for Nick Saban and with all the preseason jabber between these two when it came to recruiting and cheating and paying players and all of that jazz what will happen on the field aaron you go go first a and m alabama who you riding with this week well 
my lucky socks tell me to go with A&M because, well, they're bad and they're playing Alabama. So that usually means that they're going to win, right? Well, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't think so this year, man. Give me Alabama. Chris? You know, if this was at A&M, I might give them a chance. But I think going into Alabama, they're going to be overmatched. And like you said, they say they're okay, but Saban wants to just put it to Jimbo. I have no doubt. Give me Alabama. Whatever the spread is, I haven't looked it up. Take the over. I don't care if if he's got to bring uh, um, Eli Manning and and his and his uh, mask that he tried to wear when he was at Penn State onto the field and give him one more game of eligibility. Nick Saban will not lose this game, and if he has the opportunity, he will absolutely curb stomp Jimbo Fisher this week. Work it down. This will be a Woody Hayes, why did you go for two? Because I couldn't go for three moment if if he has the opportunity. And I expect this one to be very chippy on the field, guys. Um, and I think that honestly plays in the A&M's favor. Because I think if there's any way they're going to beat Alabama, they got to get crim- the Crimson Tide emotional. They've got to get them emotional. If, they, if Crimson Tide play this like a normal football game, where it's just X's and O's, and it's a business, it's a business uh, game, another business game Saturday. I think Alabama destroys them, so I'm going to take the Alabama Crimson Tide. Aaron, any thoughts on that? I know you're down in Texas, man. Any any word down there? What's going on with this? Uh, honestly, the, the the part of Texas that I'm in is close to Waco and Austin, uh, not really Texas A&M area. Uh, so a lot of it's more about the Longhorns and the Bears. So uh, nothing really. Um, I haven't really heard any chatter about it. Uh, people pretty much know where Texas A&M stands, and I know the fans down here. The few that I do know in the Army, uh, they're kind of of the belief, like, what was all this money spent for? Like, you know what I mean? They spent all this money on recruiting and paying these guys to come here and they suck. Like what what's going on there? Well, so here's the thing that's kind of interesting about that. If you look at all those five stars, they all were on the defensive line. You can only play four guys on the line at one time. Yeah, but wouldn't you think that their the defense would at least be better than it is? But they're I mean, all I, on the line. Like, you didn't get any linebackers or defensive backs. They're all linemen. Heck, I don't know, then. I mean, it's, you know, it'd be like, hey, we got, we picked up, we picked up 10, five stars. Yeah, eight of them are wide receivers. You know, it's kind of like how I'm yeah. saying a little bit right now. Ain't nobody to throw it to them. I got you. Yeah. Okay, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll be honest though, like a lot of a lot of the the trash talk that I get is thanks for your quarterback. Uh, 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 talking about Quinn Ewers, I'm just like, you can have him. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for taking him. Like, I don't know what you want me to say, dude. You know, what I mean? I'm not upset. Did you see him in high school? Because I did. He looked. He didn't look that awesome. Yeah, you were you you been you you gave him like a low grade on his film, and where everybody was drooling over him, you were like, eh, I don't see it, and I. I know I we haven't got the opportunity to see Devin Brown play yet, but I don't know. Looking at those, you you watch those two films side by side. I don't know that Devin Brown's not the better quarterback. I think honesty. he is. I think Devin Brown is the better quarterback. Like quick, nothing Quinn Ewers did in high school was really that impressive. He's got a, a, an arm, but like I. You know what? I, nothing else. I, he crapped the bed in the state championship game. Like he looked terrible. His whole team looked terrible. I I just wasn't impressed. Fair enough. All right, real quick, guys. Uh, let's go ahead and look at our power rankings. Ohio State one, Michigan two, Penn State moves up to three, Maryland moves up to four. So your top four teams in the power rankings are all from the East. Minnesota falls to five. Illinois jumps up to six. Purdue jumps up to seven. Top half again. Ohio State one, Michigan two, Penn State three, Minnesota four, or excuse me, 
Maryland four, Minnesota five, Illinois six, Purdue seven. Bottom half dropping down. Iowa is now eight. Wisconsin somehow is still nine. Uh, Michigan State is 10. Rutgers remains at 11. Indiana remains at 12. Nebraska, after beating Indiana, jumps up to 13, and that moves Northwestern down to the basement at 14. Again, the bottom half, Iowa 8, Wisconsin 9, Michigan State 10, Rutgers 11, Indiana 12, Nebraska 13, Northwestern 14. I'm not going to dive into this, guys. I mean, we could sit here and and complain about it, but I'm just going to say this. I'm going to ask this question one more time. If Maryland was in the West, would they win it? Yes or no, Chris? Hands down. Easily. Aaron. Easily. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see a way that they would lose it. Okay, there you go. So I think we're justified in putting Maryland four. Uh, I, I really I really am. They played Michigan tough. Um, I'm I worried about that game. It's the last game before the game. It's in the, on the road. That that one is not that it's a trap game. When everybody says it's a trap game, it's no longer a trap game. But that's a trap game. Let's just call it what it is. That's gonna be a tough game, man. They better not be looking too far ahead because that that one could bite us in the butt, man. I'm telling you. Our defensive there, backs better better be ready to play that one. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah it, that will be probably the best wide receiver tandem unless someone gets injured with quarterback combination we will see all season i kid you not now defensively they're terrible but you know i don't want to get into a what was that 2018 shootout again where we barely held on in overtime and somehow they drop a wire miss a wide (laughs) two-point conversion that would have won the game and and forced us to wish you know what it, that next game against the team up north wouldn't have even mattered. They would have went to the Big Ten championship game if we'd have lost that game. So, because we had lost to Purdue earlier that season. Yeah. So and that's that's what worries me about that game is is Maryland. You know, because we're being who we are and what we are, we're going to take everybody's best shot week after week. In theory, now. What I'm worried about is Maryland is going to absolutely show up and give us all we want. Hopefully nobody gets hurt, but I think that there's going to be, I I don't know, because the Michigan week, there's an extra energy. There's an extra gear, an extra whatever, you know what I mean, for Ohio State and for that team up north that particular week, but – I'm just hoping nobody gets hurt, dinged up, because that is the last thing we need the week before that game. So this week's schedule in the Big Ten, Nebraska travels to Piscataway, New Jersey tomorrow night, Friday night. It's on uh, FS1 if you want to watch it tomorrow night. Nebraska's at Rutgers, 7 p.m. on FS1. Uh, The team up north travels to um, Bloomington to take on the Hoosiers. Purdue travels to Maryland. Wisconsin, that's going to be a good game, actually, right there. Purdue at Maryland. Uh, that's at noon on the Big Ten Network. Wisconsin travels to Northwestern. Talk about a – if Northwestern wins that game and are 2-1 and one and in the lead, I might poop myself. I can't I can't believe it. I might have to wear the pins, Chris, to the party Saturday. Man. You, you, just, don't, just don't do it <laughs> far on the way back, Eric. That's all I have. I cannot. Northwestern is terrible, and they could still be in the lead. Ohio State's at Michigan (laughs) State in East Lansing. That's 4 p.m. on ABC. And then the nightcap on the Big Ten Network is Iowa at Illinois. Could Illinois be in the lead at 2-1? There's the West, man. I'm telling you, it is crazy, crazy. At the end of the week, at the end of the day, Saturday, who is 2-1 and and leading the West, Aaron? Illinois. Chris. Illinois. Okay. All right. Interesting. Rep I don't Illinois. know why. Bert's got him moving, you know. He's he's changing the culture. He's having them win. They didn't do too bad last season. I think they're taking the next step up, you know. Big Bert. All right, man. Uh, it's probably going to be Northwestern. I can't, <laughs> I can't believe I, this. 
Dude, at this point, I would not be surprised at all. Oh. Even number jeer. Oh, my gosh. Where's the depends? All right, guys. That's our show for this week. Be kind of on another I owe someone's owed. OH and sing Carmen, Ohio with all your heart. And until next time, OH! I owe! Go, Box! Oh, come, let's sing, oh. Hios praise and songs through armor while our hearts rebounding thrill and joy which death alone can still summer's heat oh winter's cold the seasons pass the years will roll time and change will surely show how firm thy friendship, oh, how